Good morning. I want to welcome everybody here this morning on this Easter uh, 2020. And we look outside here in Pueblo and we see snow. It was in the 70s yesterday and today we've got snow. It's just the way the weather works in Pueblo and in Colorado in general. And so today we were hopeful that we could be outdoors for this Easter service in our backyard, which we, we did all the testing and, and setting up and, and pre preparation yesterday. And it just didn't work out to be able to do that this morning. I think that uh, uh, we've already had a comment about uh, the wall that we have here in our front room uh, with the beach. Uh, the beach theme going on there and yeah on a day when we look outside and see snow uh, maybe you'll enjoy a little bit more uh, a little bit more beach um, as we are on Facebook live this morning I would like to encourage you to check in to uh, uh, on your device whether you be on a, uh, a laptop or a, a desktop computer or on an iPad or your phone uh, just uh, just say hi so that we know that you're there and we can uh, we can kind of keep an idea of of the folks that are tuning in with us on Sunday mornings that would be a real encouragement to us uh, to get your input and feedback or even just that you were here this morning. Um, so moving on, I want to also encourage you if uh, you tuned in last week, we had a really great video um, available from Christy Cooper and her kids who are a worship team and there is another one this morning that's on the Facebook page that you are encouraged to go in and uh, view. It is wonderful. They are doing a terrific job. Uh, believe it or not, they're, they're doing it all from, uh, from the living room of their home. And I want to give them uh, a real shout out because they are just, they're just incredible. And so we're very, very grateful for the fact that they are doing that for us, uh, continuing on uh, even in this difficult time. Um, I also want to then uh, let you guys know that if, if you are in the Pueblo, Pueblo West area and you do not have a mask to wear for when you are away from home or when you have uh, the need to go grocery shopping or, or to the doctor's office or whatever and you want to have a mask, uh, we have those available. Uh, you can get in touch with uh, my wife, Joetta Kelson, and you can um, get a, a, a free mask. Karen Anderson is making them. Uh, and Joetta also has made some and so if you have a need for a mask or your someone in your family does reach out to us let us know and we will deliver it to your porch we'll get it to you so that you can have uh, a mask during during this this time when we're we're awaiting the the flattening of the curve and and the the opportunity to be past this coronavirus um, so that being said, if you have one call, you would have, um, uh, you would have heard uh, the phone number, but if not, um, you, uh, you, here I'll speak into my microphone and you can um, hear her phone number right now. Uh, it's 719-671-3493. Let me repeat that one more time. It's 719-671-3493. 3493 and then you will be able to get in touch with Joetta and then we'll make arrangements to get you um, one of the masks like I said Karen Anderson is making them and Joetta has made a few uh, Karen's made a lot uh, and so we'll uh, we'll go with those and, and get you all set if you have not got a mask if you've even got one but you'd like a second so that you can wash one wear one that kind of a thing you might want to consider that as well so those things being said, the last thing I want to do is remind you, this is my phone number, and if you need anything, I would encourage you, and if, or if your neighbors need anything, pass this along. This is my number. You can text me. You can call me. Let me know if there's something that we can do to serve you during this difficult time. If you can't get out, if you need something done, uh, let us know. So give me a call. Give me a text, however that works best for you, and let's see what we can do to help you get through this. All right, we're going to continue on then this morning, and at this point, uh, I'll turn over, the, uh, turn over the mic to my wife, Joetta, as she will lead us in prayer. 
Good morning, friends, and happy Easter. I feel very, very blessed to be here with all of you today and um, share in this opportunity with the greatest love story of all. So if you will all join me in prayer, that would be great. Father God, thank you so much for all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. Thank you for sending your one and only son to, um, to, to come as a human and spend time with us and then also to die on the cross and rise so that all of us can be saved. I pray for our friends and family today, near and far, so that they will all come to know the love that you have to offer for us. Thank you for all that you do, for all the blessings. We ask and pray for your um, safe keeping of us and for the end of this virus so that we can get back to our new normal with you in all of our lives. Thank you again as we celebrate the risen, um, the, the, riot, the rise of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Thank you for all that you do. It is in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So then moving on in our service is when we start to move towards the communion portion of the service at, here at Christ Church. What we do, Christ Church Public West, what we do is we practice communion every single Sunday. We have, we have an opportunity for you to join in the Lord's Supper every time we worship. And we're going to do that here in just a second. But real quick, I wanted to point something out to you. Um, if you have noticed the background, there's a cross back there uh, made from some uh, redwood 4x4s. And I want to say that uh, I'm very grateful to my father-in-law, Stan Gasnick, for building this cross. Originally it was put together to walk it from the Mesa where we live out to the church building on Good Friday, but I figured that with the um, us encouraging you to stay home, it probably didn't make a whole lot of sense to go out and do it, but it is going to happen. It's just going to be yeah, pun intended, down the road. We're going we're gonna to take the, the cross and take it on the road sometime after we get past this this storm, this bump in the road that we're in right now, and then we'll have an opportunity to share that with those folks in our community who have yet to know Christ. All right, so the communion, the way that works is that since we're at home, if you've got grape juice and a cracker, or if you've got Gatorade and a piece of bread, whatever you've got, that works. We are going to celebrate the sharing of Christ. We are going to celebrate communion with him in representing his body and his blood. And so I would encourage you, if you have those items ready now, great. If you, uh, if you want to grab something real quick, that's fine. I'm going to get us started in the devotional that, that takes us into the communion. And at Christ Church, if you are a believer and know Jesus Christ and have invited him into your life as Lord and Savior, what we say is we practice what's called an open communion. You are welcome to participate in communion with us if you have invited Christ to be your Lord and your Savior. Jesus, he began his ministry by being hungry, yet he is the bread of life. Jesus ended his earthly ministry by being thirsty, yet he is the living water. Jesus was weary, yet he is our rest. Jesus paid tribute, yet he is our king. Jesus was accused of having a demon, yet he cast out demons. Jesus wept, yet he wipes away all of our tears. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver, yet he redeemed the world. Jesus was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, yet he is the good shepherd. Jesus died, yet by his death he destroyed the power of death and lives. Let's pray. Lord, we are so humbled at the sacrifice that you have made for us. You have surrendered your Son, our Savior, to die on the cross, to take every sin from us upon yourself. Lord, and you did that so that you would be able to have fellowship with us, so that we would be able to be with you. Lord, you are the God of all, 
the Creator. You are our Father. And Lord, we are grateful. And Father, we thank You for Your Son. We thank You for His body that He gave up for us. We thank You that when we take of the cracker or the bread or whatever we're using today, we are remembering that He sacrificed, He was tortured, that He was killed for us. It is in His body that we have a connection, a human connection to our God. Lord, thank You. We praise You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Then when we take of the blood, we take of the juice in remembrance of Christ and the blood that was spilled for us because the power is in the blood. It is the blood of Christ that washes us clean. It is what has saved us. It is what He gave. It is what Jesus has done. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful for the opportunity to be in your presence today. Lord, we are, we are beyond blown away by the fact that Jesus was willing to literally be beaten for us, to bleed for us, to die for us. The blood that was spilled is where the life is. It is the life that is in the blood of Christ that redeems us and gives us a righteousness that we could never have of our own. We are ever so grateful, Lord, for that sacrifice, for giving that up. Father, thank you. Thank you for all that you have done. Thank you, Jesus, for giving everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it is during this time that I want to encourage you to be a part of what Christ Church Pueblo West is doing. This is the time in the service when we would receive an offering if we were in our church building. And so by that, with that being a part of what we are currently doing, I want to encourage you to continue to do that if you at all can. We have the opportunity both on our website, which is Christ Church 
www.pw to, to give online, or you can also mail your offering to P.O. Box 7655. Uh, and we have no idea right now how long we are going to continue to do this remotely and to be out. So if you are um, wanting to continue and to be a part of what the work is that the church is doing, because even though the building is closed, the church is not. We are continuing to serve because the church is you and me. The church is the body of Christ. We, we are not a building. We are a body. And we live and breathe and we continue to serve others and find ways to do that. And I want to also encourage you, if you've got ideas or needs and things like that, please get in touch with me. I'll show you the phone number again uh, when we're finished this morning. But I want to say that you can always go to the website. You can always go to our Facebook page and reach out and get in touch with me there. My phone number is there. I encourage you to give me a call. But at this time, I want to encourage you to be a part of what God is doing because when we look around and people are struggling and people are having to deal with situations that they're not used to, this is a great opportunity for us to step up and to love on folks. So keep that in your heart, keep that in your mind, and let me pray over you for, uh, for what God is doing. Lord, we are so grateful for all the blessings that you give us. You, you, every time you ask us to do something, you provide the resources to do it. Quite often, we might not see it that way, but it's true. And Lord, we ask that you would give us a vision to know what you would have us to do. May you put upon our hearts a way to be generous in a difficult time. May you show us what that looks like. And Lord, may we continue to plug in to you and to do what you are doing through your church body. Lord, we look forward to what the next big thing is because we know in the midst of this you're up to something. Because you use all things, all things to the benefit of those who love you. And Lord, we know that you're doing that here today. Thank you for all you do, all you have done and all you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. So, when I was somewhere around the neighborhood of four years old, I was quite a handful, I'm sure, I would get into stuff and I would leave disaster after disaster in my wake. I was the kid who would regularly tumble downstairs, crash on my bike or tricycle. I got bit by dogs. I'd hit my head more often than most kids. And one time when my dad came home from work, I got a bit of a jolt. He would hand me his keys when he would come in the door. He just kind of tossed them to me as I was running by or sitting on the floor. And this one time, I happened to be sitting on the floor and he handed me his key ring, which just was a simple metal ring that had all of his keys on it. And apparently, I was fascinated by this. This particular time when he handed the ring to me, I was seated on the floor and I wanted to pretend to use these keys to start my car. I looked for the closest thing that I could insert a key into and to get the engine to my imaginary car started. And there it was, the electrical outlet in the floor. It looked perfect. So before either of my parents could get the keys back out of my hands, I put one of the keys directly into that electrical outlet. <laughs> I can tell you that I got a lot more than, a bar than I bargained for, and that's for sure. No car actually started. <laughs> <laughs> but I did get what felt like a rocket ride as I ended up on the other side of the room. I was never, I was never interested in driving that car again. Now, you get the idea of the kind of a kid that I was and to some extent still am. Back in those days when I was a kid, I don't know about you, but my mom did a lot of writing. She wrote letters, she wrote thank you notes, all of that kind of thing, birthday cards. And you have to remember that back then there was no email, there was no texting, you, have to, uh, you had to do things by hand. And my mom had great handwriting. And to make it look even better, she used fountain pens. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, a fountain pen is one of these pens that's got a point on the end of it and a, lev and a lever on the side. And you would dip the point into a bottle of ink and you would pull back on the lever and it would then fill the pen with ink from the bottle. And then you would push the, le the lever back down and begin to write. And when the, the pen started to run dry, you would do the same thing all over again. So my mom would buy bottles of this ink 
and it usually would have a decent sized cap you know opening to the top because you would have to put the the pens in the top to get the ink out and so I had no idea what I was thinking other than I must have been wondering what the black stuff in that bottle tasted like. I can tell you that I haven't thought, I haven't thought that, that I needed to taste ink since then. So I reached up on the desk at the time and my dad's home office is, is Dan, I guess, and there was a bottle of ink there and I got it in my hand. And I plopped myself right down on the floor next to the desk on the beige carpet. And I opened the bottle. That move alone caused a splash of ink to land on the carpet, and then, then I had a mouthful. And once I realized what the ink tasted like, that mouthful of ink came right back out onto the carpet. You know, my mom wasn't very happy. I'm not sure she would still be very happy about it if she were to think about it. See, I was about four years old, and I made a mess. Do you think I was able to clean up that mess? Of course not. I didn't have a clue where to start how to clean that up. There I sat with ink on my face, on my clothes, and on the carpet right around where I was sitting, and I needed my parents to step in and clean me clean my clothes, and clean the stain on the floor. I couldn't do it. You know, we have a Father in Heaven who is very, very good at getting stains out. His specialty is removing the stains of sin. It gets all over us, and we are awash in it everywhere we go. But He can cleanse us, and He does it through the blood of His Son. Paul writes in the first of two letters to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And the first letter, the first letter by John, this would be 1 John and chapter 1 verse 7, says it this way, but if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, says, cleanses us from all sin. You see, getting the stains out is what the death of Christ on the cross did for us. But the work on the cross was followed by the best news ever. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, it says, He is not here. Wait, what's that about? Well, let's look a little bit closer in, in Mark chapter 16, starting in verse 1. Follow along if you have a Bible or an app of your own. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Solomon brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will row the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man, dressed in white, in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. He was here, but he's not here anymore. He was dead, but he's not dead anymore. Jesus pushed the boundaries of death. That's pretty much an understatement, don't you think? He is not here. People don't know what to do with that sentence. The women who, first, who were the first ones into the tomb, the first to see what had happened, they stood there trembling. They were bewildered. They were in shock. Verse 8 says, Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. 
You might say these women were scared and confused. What they had just learned made no sense to them. And you and I both know that that can be pretty frightening when something we, happens that we can't grasp. So they didn't tell anyone. They didn't tell anyone because they were afraid. Someone rose from the dead. Now what? When I graduated from college, from the University of Iowa, I used masking tape to write a message on the top of my mortar board at my commencement ceremony. After four years and one summer of classwork and passing my, my, my classes and finally getting to graduate, I had put in that work. I had gotten the grades. And now it had come time for me to be recognized for those efforts. But I had no clue as to what was next. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what to do next. I had never been in the situation before. So I wrote on the top of my mortar board with masking tape what I was feeling. Exactly what I was feeling. I wrote the two words that said, now what? I think it was a core question. I think the question that everyone was wondering. This never happened before. Now what? That sentence, he is not here. This demands a response. This demands a response from everyone. Because quite honestly, it potentially changes everything for everybody. One man who had made what many had seemed to be ridiculous claims of his divinity had told people that he was going to die. And on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. Then he did it. He actually pulled it off. The disciples who had been pretty much believing that the death of Christ was game over more than it was game on were clueless. At this point, they were probably saying things after they realized what Jesus had done. They were probably saying, well, if this turned out to be true and Jesus actually did this, then that part where he told us all that other stuff, that's got to be really true too. Let's go back and pay attention. Let's try to remember what he had said before. What were those things again? Because if Jesus said that he would be persecuted, if Jesus said that he would be beaten, if Jesus said that he would die only to be raised from the dead on the third day and he actually pulls it off, then that other stuff has got to be just as true. I think that the disciples, and most certainly the Pharisees, were now looking at the world through a completely new lens. I have a friend who has two sons. One of the boys is healthy, active, and living as an independent adult. The other son was born with Down syndrome and requires someone to care for him. The boy's dad loves them both. He loves both of his sons. The second son, the special needs son, will most likely never live on his own. So he lives at home, under the care of his father and his mother. His father protects him, cares for him, and looks out for him in every single way. This is the relationship that is a picture. It's a picture of my relationship with my Heavenly Father. It's a relationship that He longs for for each of us. You see, I just don't believe in God. I belong to God. He is not here. Four words that move me from death to life. He is not here. Four words that move me from losing in life to victory in life. He is not here. Four words that provide hope in every circumstance. We've all got to come to grips with the fact that we are dealing with a God who is not a distant God. At all times, God is trying to get closer to you and He's trying to get closer to me. God says, I can never have too many kids. There is always room for one more son. There is always room for one more daughter. And our God doesn't just foster parent kids. He adopts them fully and completely into the family. When I took a swig from that bottle of ink, I wasn't strong enough to clean up the stain on the floor, on my clothes, even on my face. But my parents... They were strong enough. When I wasn't strong enough to scrub myself clean of the stain of sin, my dad, my father in heaven, was strong enough to scrub away every stain that I had left in my life. I couldn't get myself cleaned up on my own. 
I couldn't remove the stain caused by the ink, and I certainly can't get myself cleaned up when it comes to washing away the sin in my life. For that, I need heavenly help. I need a supernatural cleaning. I need Jesus. Isn't it interesting that of all the language that Jesus could have used to describe what he was talking about, he chose the phrase, born again. Jesus wants to restore our childlike innocence, our childlike faith that trusts in God completely. He wants us to have the faith of a child and to process the world around us with the joy of a kid and to fully rely on him. If we look in Matthew chapter 18, we read, He, Jesus, called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It continues to amaze me that it is through death, the death of Jesus, that we are given a chance to be born again. His death, our life. It is through this death, then, that we can have life. His death, our eternal life. All because 2,000 years ago, our king defeated our greatest enemy death. Luke chapter 24 verse 1 and following says this, but very early on Sunday morning the women went to the tomb taking the spices that they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance so they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, hang on to this next sentence, this question, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and that he would rise again on the third day. Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? Apparently, it wasn't over. Frederick Buechner said it this way, Just as his birth was not the beginning of him, his death was not the end of him. That's so good I need to share it with you one more time. He's talking about Jesus. Just as his birth was not the beginning of him, his death was not the end of him. Right now, I want you to do something. I want you to bring your hands together, and I want you to place your left hand in your right one. Do you feel that? That is the hand of a living and breathing person. You. Jesus, during his earthly ministry, was just as real as that. So put yourself in the place of the women who hugged Jesus. They had eaten with him. They had been close to him. He appeared to be every bit a man. Why? Because he was. And then they saw him flogged, beaten. They saw him placed upon a cross until he had taken his last breath and died. They saw him taken down and put in a tomb. Watching someone else die does something to you. Not only do you hurt for them and hurt for yourself, but experiencing death like that also reminds us of our own mortality. But in the case of Jesus, that was about to change. Jesus had told the disciples what was going to happen, but it was either beyond their understanding or it got lost in everything else that was going on during the time. Either way, when they saw Jesus go limp on the cross, they were just crushed. There was no shouts of joy because they knew he was going to be raised. There was no whisper of, just wait, he'll be back. It had completely slipped their minds that he had told them that this was going to happen and it wouldn't be the end. We need to pause right here for just a second because I want you to understand something. Just because this was hundreds, hundreds of years ago and none of us were there doesn't make it any less true. Jesus was and is real. He is as real as you you and me. And he really did die. He really did do it for you so that you will have a shot at eternal life if you choose so. 
We need to stop thinking of the Easter story like a fairy tale or something that happened a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Yes, it was 2,000 years ago, but it was also very real. So true that the only way you and I could ever be rescued from the price that has to be paid for the sins that we have committed is Jesus. If you don't yet have a relationship with Jesus, what are you waiting for? He has been waiting for you to open up your heart to Him. And for many of us who already believe, it's time for us to get up off our blessed assurance and take this relationship to the next level. Jesus is who He says He is. We need to give the Son of God the glory and the awe-filled reverence that He deserves. He needs to be treated like the conquering hero that He is. He is the only king I can think of who died for each and every, of, each and every one of His subjects before they were actually His subjects. Jesus is real. When the question is sin, Jesus is the answer. The only answer. And He wants to draw you to Himself. He loves you like you have never been loved before. And in a way that no person ever could. And while it may have been 2,000 years ago, the tomb is still vacant. And the throne is not. With that in mind, church, we are in the midst of a storm. And when this worldwide pandemic is over, there will be a lot of hurting people. A lot of people who have both physical and spiritual needs. We, Christ Church, are positioned in this time and in this place for just this reason. It's no accident. It is no coincidence that you and I are here today, right now. God put us here to be the church. He put us here to share the love of Christ, the resurrected Savior. And He put us here to do it in many different ways. So let's not miss this amazing opportunity to join in God's plan to seek and to save the lost. Jesus explained it to Martha as she mourned the loss of Lazarus before Jesus restored him to life. John chapter 11 says this, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do we? Do we believe this? If we really believe that Jesus is who he says he is, we need to put some action to our faith. Let's use this time to love people from a distance, and to prepare to serve them when we're able to be in fellowship and to come together again. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to live by believing. By believing the angel in the tomb who said, He is not here. Let me pray for us. Lord, you have done something beyond what we ever could hope or imagine. You have given us the opportunity to be rescued. You have paid the price for our sins. You have given up of yourself to rescue us. Lord, we don't deserve any of it. It is through your grace and your mercy alone that we are saved. And Father, we are so grateful, so grateful when we realize that we have a full eternity yet to come. And it can be one of two ways. It can be in your presence and filled with, with joy and love, or it can be absent from you and filled with darkness and very much aloneness. And we get to choose. You've given us the opportunity to choose one over the other. Father, thank you. I pray that those who do not yet know you would feel your presence and your spirit upon them at this very moment and that they would be drawn to you. Lord, touch and change hearts today through the resurrection of your Son. Father, it is an amazing time. It is an amazing time to recognize that we are here to represent you. No matter how things shape up in our world, we are part of your plan. And you do have a plan. We are grateful. We are humble. And we look forward to what you're going to do next. And Lord, we say, here am I, send me. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So, I want to once again remind you that 
as far as we know, we're going to be back next Sunday at 1030 right here on this Facebook Live doing another service. And I want you to remember that if you've got any needs, if there's anything that we can do for you, I would ask that you just reach out to me at this phone number, 406-1331. Write that down, punch it into your phone, make it one of your favorites, whatever. Give me a call. Even if you just want to talk, that's fine too. Let me have the opportunity to hear from you. I also want to remind you that Christy has a video that's posted on this same page that you can go and enjoy the worship music that, that they put together, the worship team, Christy, Zach, and Haley for this morning. We're also going to put this message along with their video on the Christ Church Pueblo West YouTube page here in a short bit. And anybody that you would like to encourage to look at this message, it will stay on this page. You can go back and, and look at it anytime you like. The very last thing I want to tell you is that if you still need to get your hands on a mask, please, please, please reach out to my wife, Joetta, and she can make that happen. Karen Anderson has made amazing masks. Joetta's made a few that are pretty amazing too, and we've got the opportunity to share those with you. So if you need one, please, please reach out. So if you don't know Christ yet as your Lord and your Savior, open up today. Realize that He was willing to die for you while you weren't even willing to entertain who He was. Jesus is willing to give it all up to save you. And when you make that decision, when you come to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, we will baptize you into the family where you get to go through what we like to consider and many in Christianity consider going through the, the death and the resurrection of Christ in an immersion baptism. It's an amazing and beautiful and exciting thing to witness and to be a part of. Have an amazing rest of your Easter. Enjoy your family. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Love you guys. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.